Here is an introduction to habitability to accompany chapter 30 of the textbook Astronomy from OpenStax. So habitability, just the definition of it, is the capability of an environment to host life. So this is somewhere in the universe where life can be hosted. And uh, what, you know, what do we mean by that? Because that's a pretty vague definition. So, you know, life in general is hard to define. And, you know, in terms of how life can, can exist or the types of conditions that life can exist under, we don't have a very large data set, right? We just have Earth and the types of conditions that you have on Earth. That's, that's pretty much it. So the working definition then for life or criterion is there has to be liquid water on an object and you need to have the chemical building blocks of carbon-based life that we'll talk about in, in a little bit. And so that's just the minimum set of conditions that you need to fulfill and likely you need to fulfill more than that. So it's important to note that being habitable does not imply being inhabited, right? Just because you can host life doesn't mean that you do. And so habitability is really a, a separate question. It's related, but separate from uh, extraterrestrial life or, you know, in especially intelligent life. And there'll be a separate, um, a separate lecture. We'll talk about something called the Drake equation, and we can try to estimate, you know, that... Um, the, the frequency of extraterrestrial life in the universe. But that's not for this lecture. Here we're just talking about whether or not life could in principle be sustain, sustained on an object. And importantly, this isn't limited just to planets, but also moons can be habitable as we'll talk about in a moment. And another thing is, is though we're being pretty close-minded and we're just using Earth as the set of conditions that that uh, we consider when whether or not you can host life. Uh, you know, we could consider objects that are completely covered in water. Um, that is, in principle, an object that could host life, right? There's, there's liquid water there. Uh, or an object where you have a subterranean ocean. So a frozen surface, but a subterranean ocean that's heated from the object's interior. That, in principle, could be a habitable environment as well. And I'll mention in a, in a few minutes about how that could come to be. So before we talk about defining a habitable zone, I need to give you a quick refresher on water. So as you know, right, water can, there's three different phases that can exist in. It can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Uh, usually when we're, when everyday life, when we say water, we mean the liquid form. Um, but you know, in, in astronomy and physics, water just means any form. So. Liquid water is what we need for habitability. Um, you know, ice and water vapor, the gas doesn't really cut it. And whether or not you have uh, liquid water is going to depend on the temperature and pressure of your environment. So this is a phase diagram. The pressure's in the vertical direction. Note that it's a log scale. And the uh, horizontal direction is the temperature. And you can see liquid water is in this kind of um, sweet spot here. So uh, Earth, it's located pr pretty solidly in the liquid water um, uh, regime here. And, but what you can notice is that you don't have to have Earth's pressure and temperature to host liquid water. You could have a, a more massive um, Earth, for instance, that has a higher pressure. And if it had a higher pressure, then you could sustain liquid water at higher temperatures than can be sustained on Earth. So at Earth, you know, water boils at around uh, 373 Kelvin. Uh, but if you had a super Earth, something that was more massive and therefore a thicker atmosphere, you, you could be hotter on the surface, even up to, you know, 400 Kelvin, and there would still be a liquid water there. Um, in principle, uh, greenhouse gas conditions can also modify whether or not a planet is able to host um, liquid water. So, for instance, if you were able to somehow terraform Mars and um, introduce greenhouse gases there, you could make the atmosphere thicker, higher pressure, and you could push it from the very corner of this liquid water region in the face space diagram up into a region where there's um, liquid water possible on more of the surface and for more of the Martian year. So, in principle, you know, greenhouse gases can be a good thing. They can also be a bad thing. You can consider Venus, where Venus is 
much hotter than it otherwise uh, would be if it weren't for its greenhouse gas atmosphere. And so in principle, it could host liquid water if it weren't for the greenhouse gases. And instead, it's extremely hot and um, you know all water there is gonna be a, a water vapor. So knowing this about water, we can define a habitable zone. And this is just the distance from the star in which liquid water is gonna be possible. And that's shown on this diagram here. You have a stellar surface temperature versus the stellar distance. So this is the distance between your planet and the star. And the habitable zone is basically this, this pink colored band here. Um, the difference between dark pink and light, light pink is how generous you are in terms of whether or not you can um, have liquid water or whether or not you can host life. But basically the pink band is the habitable zone. Clearly it varies by the stellar type that you have here. And the stellar type is indicated on the right axis. Um, typically, when we're talking about habitability for stars, we're just going to consider main sequence stars. As we uh, covered back in the stellar evolution lectures, um, you know, the, you're not in any of the uh, stellar evolution stages beyond the main sequence for long enough, really, for anything interesting to happen in terms of evolution of life. So we don't really care about anything other than, than main sequence stars. Um, when we're talking about a habitable region, because you know you need a stable environment long enough for for life to get be able to evolve somewhere. Uh, another issue that you have is that you know not only do you need the star to live long enough, but you don't want there, want there to be too much ultraviolet radiation. So if there's a lot of ultraviolet radiation, at least in terms of life as we know it on Earth, it can't sustain that. And so that is another reason to rule out very hot, um, massive stars. Because as you remember from the black body spectrum that we covered a while back, those hotter surface temperatures are gonna have more UV radiation and that would be a problem. Um, now on the, the lower mass end, what you need to consider is that as you get to these lower mass stars, the habitable zone shrinks. So a planet doesn't have a lot of wiggle room in terms of staying in the habitable zone, habitable zone throughout its year. So that's a problem, right? And it would have to have a very circular orbit. And then another issue is that when you get um, to very close distances to the host star, a sort of complicated gravitational interaction can happen called tidal locking, where the face of the, the same face of the planet will always face the star or it doesn't have to be exactly that simple, but nonetheless, you basically wind up baking part of the surface of a planet a lot longer than you do on the Earth, right? So the, the Earth's basically like rotisserie. It's um, constantly changing which face is, is uh, which side is facing the sun, whereas the moon, right, is tidally locked. We're always looking at the same side. And you can imagine why that would be problematic if you were always only baking the same side of a planet. So that sort of sets the the lower mass end in terms of um, habitability. So we're basically looking at then F, G, K, and M type stars. Um, so the advantage of the F stars is there's a big old, a uh, very big habitable zone. The advantage of the M stars is there are a lot more of them. And um, you know, you can, in principle can have habitability anywhere in between. And we know of at least one G star that has a habitable planet because we live, uh, live on it. And another thing to consider in terms of where your planet is uh, with respect to the star that it's at is the, the planet needs to not be basically bombarded too much with uh, radiation from that star. So there's going to be energetic particles from a, a stellar wind being blown out. And so somehow life probably needs to be protected from that. Uh, you, the usual way around that we think would be to have a magnetic field. So Earth's magnetic field uh, protects us from solar winds. So in principle, your planet needs to have a magnetic field as well. Otherwise, that's going to be a, a problem. Now, for life, we generally would assume there's probably going to be plant-based life in any habitable environment. Um, and if you want plant-based life, again, just based on Earth, we assume that photosynthesis, you would probably want that to happen. You know, all the green...
the green plants on Earth have photosynthesis. Um, and so if you want to have that, you, you get a little bit more restrictive in terms of your conditions. So again, we have to just base everything on Earth because that's the only place that life exists uh, that, that we know of. And so in Earth, we see photosynthesis requires uh, a sufficient amount of light in the 400 to 700 nanometer wavelength range. So we call this the photosyn photosynthetically active region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so you need to consider the flux of uh, photons within the photosynthetically active region um, on your planet, if you want to say whether or not it probably has enough light in order to sustain photosynthesis and how much uh, plant-based materi plant material could it host based on this amount of light. So what's shown here is the photon flux in the vertical direction versus the surface temperature of the host star and the habitable zone is this blue band here. So you'd be in between the, the blue lines gives you a, a habitable zone. Here we have Earth um, is shown as this green dot. And these yellow dots, these are um, extrasolar planets that have been found. Um, the minimum amount of light you need to sustain oxygenic photosynthesis is this green line here. It's not too much in the photosynthetically active region. So these planets all have that much. Um, in terms of the minimum amount of light that you need uh, in order to sustain the amount of biological material that's like on Earth, um, you need to be above this red line. Uh, so you'll see there's, there's at least one extrasolar planet that has that amount of light on its surface, which is, um, which is pretty cool. So, so the point here is that you know, it's not only habitability that matters, but you also do want to consider this photosynthetically active uh, region flux of light. Just as a minor point, you might wonder if this red line is the, the minimum amount of light you need on Earth for, um, to sustain our plant-based matter, and yet Earth has a much higher flux than that. It turns out Earth, uh, the plants are limited by nutrients in the soil. If there were more nutrients available, then in principle, even more plant-based matter could be sustained, which is kind of interesting. So we need to consider the distance to the star and the, the host star type. Um, again, in a little bit more detailed way than we would just for the surface temperature for liquid water, uh, for photosynthetic life habitability. And we can get a little bit more creative when we define the habitable zone. So, so far we've just talked about the distance from the star enabling um, liquid water and we've talked about the light from the star providing energy for, you know, plant-based matter to survive, but really all you need is an adequate heat source, right, to provide energy and to make sure that water is liquid. And so the, when you get creative, you can think about moons in principle could host life. So on a moon, if you're um, the right distance from the, the host planet that the moon is, is orbiting, then there are strong tidal forces on that planet. It's basically like a stretching and compressing. Um, so we have small tidal forces on the Earth from the moon um, but, and vice versa, but you, you can have much larger tidal forces than that and it basically kind of stretches and compresses the planet and that uh, winds up transferring heat into the interior of that moon. Um, and there are several moons in our solar system that uh, have liquid water because of this these tidal forces. So in Saturn, you have Titan and Enceladus, and Jupiter, the four Galilean moons, are all fall into this category. So it's it's not only plausible, this we know at least liquid water happens because of this uh, effect. And what this does is this extends your habitable zone well beyond the terrestrial uh, habitable zone. So that's shown in this plot here. The vertical direction, this is the distance between the planet and its moon, the potentially habitable moon. The horizontal axis is the distance between the star and the planet. And so while your traditional habitable zone in, in this particular case, um, this is for a star of solar luminosity, while your typical, uh, or roughly solar luminosity, while your typical habitable zone would be in this vertical 
region here bounded by these two dashed lines, you can see that uh, the habitable zone gets extended far beyond that to much further distances from the uh, from the, the star in that system because of these tidal forces. And, and you see that once you get in this case, you know, a few Earth to Sun distances away, a few astronomical units away, it doesn't even matter how far you are away. There's, there's basically almost no energy being given um, or a negligible amount of energy being given by the light from the host star. It's all the tidal heating that does it. And so this is interesting because, you know, this, this really expands the opportunities for life in a stellar system. For, for basic statistics, just look to our solar system. So in the habitable zone, you know, if things would have turned out differently, arguably Venus and Mars and Earth are in that. So you got three planets that could have been habitable at one point, maybe. Um, we'll talk more about that in a future lecture. Um, but then, you know, we have six moons that could maybe be habitable. So you, you really increase the statistics quite a bit for any stellar system in terms of habitability when you bring into the uh, moons into the picture. Now for life, aside from just having the right temperature for liquid water, we need to have the right ingredients. So uh, when we look at what the solar system is made of, for instance, we see that we have mostly hydrogen and helium and then a lot of um, other stuff. And this is, you know, what the universe is made of is mostly hydrogen and helium. Um, then in terms of what goes into making uh, a planet, I should mention this is abundance in uh, funny units. It's like a log scale kind of uh, versus the atomic number. So this, you'd, you'd read the element by going in the horizontal direction. So in any case, your, your stole, uh, stellar system, or in this case, the solar system has some abundances this is gonna get modified uh, by the escape velocity of the planet. So if we've talked about this in the past, but if you look at the escape velocity versus the, um, the surface temperature of an object, you see that for instance, like on Earth, you, know, you can trap liquid water, but you can't trap hydrogen and helium. So even though hydrogen and helium are a huge fraction of the solar system, it's a tiny fraction of what you have on Earth because you can't trap it. So, so the, your stellar system composition is gonna get modified by the escape velocity of the object. There's also going to be planetary differentiation. So your higher mass atoms are going to sink. Um, if the object was hot enough, they're going to sink towards the center. The lighter elements are going to stay on top. That's, for instance, why Earth's core is nickel iron and the crust is more like silicon magnesium, that kind of stuff. And you also have chemical separation. Um, of elements. So for instance, things forming into rocks and some of those may form deeper or shallower. So all kinds of chemistry and geology will affect your surface composition. And then that's what finally allows you to arrive at the elemental abundances on a planet's surface. And you can see, for instance, here's the abundance um, in a log scale versus atomic number for the, the um, crust of Earth. And then the atmosphere is shown on the right here. So you go from your solar abundances to instead the atmosphere is a lot of nitrogen, right? It's not a lot of hydrogen and helium. Um, and then the surface uh, has a lot of oxygen um, trapped in, you know, different molecules and silicon, even though you really would expect um, perhaps some lighter elements uh, being prevalent there. Now what matters aren't just those any old element, you need specific elements. So you need the ingredients to life. And these so-called chinops elements, these are really the essential ingredients. So you have carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. Uh, why we care about these elements so much is that they, this is the vast majority of the mass of every plant and animal on the earth. Um, and, and really that's the, the Chan or Chino elements that make up most of the mass. Phosphorus and sulfur are listed here because they play really key roles in um, biology uh, in terms of the, the chemistry that's relevant for biology on Earth. So that's why they get grouped in here. And if you look at these, uh, look for these elements in the Milky Way, for instance, you'll see they're very uh, prevalent. So this is data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, what we're looking at in uh, different regions are absorption spectra. Uh, 
And so the color tells you the element that we're dealing with. The depth of the absorption line is how much that you have. And you can see you have a lot of this stuff all throughout the Milky Way. And <clears throat> an artist has colored different parts of the human body that, that rely on um, some of these elements. There's, of course, some artistic liberty here. You need these elements probably you know, throughout most of your body, to be honest. OK, and then finally, uh, you know, having you have uh, liquid water, you have the ingredients, but you need to go from those ingredients to having actual life. And that's what the field of astrobiology covers. So it's, it's how do you get from having the right ingredients to creating an actual living thing? And, um, you know, we don't know the answer to that. So when we look out in space, we see lots of organic molecules and even organic molecules that have made amino acids. Um, we observe these in interstellar dust. We see them in meteorites. So making at least the, the very basic building blocks of life, um, that seems to be prevalent. That seems to be uh, easy to explain-ish, or at least we see those, those um, molecules out there in you know, dead parts of space. The big problem is so-called abiogenesis. So going from those building blocks these, these simple organic molecules, these simple amino acids, to the really complicated building block uh, chemicals of life. So lipids that make up cell walls, you have carbohydrates, you have amino acids, the nucleic acids, right, DNA, RNA. How do you make those? Um, how did those come to be in the first place? We don't know, right? That's what astrobiology is trying to figure out. And the, the two main ways to study this are basically you can do direct experiments. So you can try to create conditions that are like um, in interstellar space or like on a comet or like on a young Earth. You can set up those conditions, uh, dump in the ingredients and see what happens. Try to make more complicated molecules that way. Um, and then the other way is observationally. So you look at just really old fossils on Earth and try to understand what the, the earliest life forms on Earth were made of. And those are the main two. Uh, directions to try to figure out how you go from habitability to actual life uh, occurring on an object. And that is it for this introduction to habitability for Astronomy 1000.